Hey everyone, welcome back to The Coop with Meyer Hatchery, where we talk all things poultry in hopes of educating chicken keepers and inspiring future flock owners. I'm Amanda, and today we continue our three-part series called Meat Shortages, Now What? With a focus on not only raising meat birds, but processing as well. As we've mentioned before, Processing poultry or any type of animal for meat isn't for everyone, but given the increasing shortages and lack of options at the local grocery stores, many are considering diving into a homesteading lifestyle and have a growing desire to grow and raise their own food. Gaining or having the skills to raise and process your own food provides a sense of security. Take advantage of $5 off your next Meyer Hatchery order by entering the coupon code THECOOP2022 at checkout. Today, I'm joined by one of Meyer Hatchery's ambassadors, Megan Gates. Megan, along with her husband and two young children, call Oklahoma home. Making food is her passion. Megan, like so many of us, is determined to provide her family with the best homegrown food possible. I am so excited to learn all about her experience raising and processing poultry, not only for her own family, but also for her community, as well as a great resource she has developed for those interested in wanting to learn more about the process. Good afternoon, Megan. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy homesteading schedule to meet with me today to talk about meat chickens and your experience and your story. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. I'm really excited because you have little Hazel, only six months old, doing her first podcast today. So I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Hazel. So why don't we start out by you telling us a little bit about yourself, how you got into raising and processing your own poultry and the homesteading lifestyle. Sure. Um, so my name is Megan Gates and I live out in the Oklahoma Panhandle and I have been around animals and specifically beef cattle for my entire life, but I have really jumped more into the homesteading thing in the past five or so years, right after my husband and I got married. Um, I really have kind of had like this dream my entire life to have a farm with all the animals and a big garden and be more self-sufficient. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from how my grandmother's and my relationship was cooking with her in the kitchen, canning every year after harvest, um, you know, eating nose to tail, those kind of things. She really instilled that desire in me to want to do this, to do similar things to that. Um, and so I just said one day I'm going to get laying hens and that was my first kind of project and I'd never had any experience with chickens before, but I learned as I went and I asked a lot of people as I went and, you know, here we are five years later, you know, and learned so many skills in such a short amount of time. That's one of the reasons that I really love homesteading in and of itself. Um, but specifically with meat birds, I, even though grocery store chicken is perfectly safe, it always kind of grossed me out if I'm being honest. <laughs> and I did not want to um, feel scared by my food. I did. And, and it was all in my head. Like I know grocery store chicken is perfectly fine, but I was like, it, it scares me that I'm going to give my family food poisoning. If if I don't cook the heck out of it and make it super dry and not taste very good. And so I was like, well, I raise chickens for eggs. I can raise chickens for me. You know, my grandma did it. My mom did it. Like my husband's boss has raised chickens his whole life. I have plenty of resources and I, I just dove right in head first. And, um, the first, I mean, I'm still learning all the time, but the first experience was a big learning curve to get to, to being proficient at raising my own meat birds. But I'm really, really thankful I did because I don't buy any other chicken other than the chicken that we, other than chicks to raise into meat for ourselves now. 
And so do you just raise meat chickens or do you also do turkeys as well? I just started doing turkeys. So I have my first turkey poults um, and they are only a few weeks old right now. Um, and so I'm raising those now as well. Just a few because I, you know, feed's expensive right now. And I really just want like a Thanksgiving turkey for my family, Thanksgiving turkey for uh, my parents and a couple other people. So we're just doing a handful of turkeys, but um, we mostly, you know, the meat birds is the, is the bulk of our process. And do you do Rangers or Cornish Cross? I do Cornish cross. Um, I have found that because, so my husband really likes white meat and with the Cornish crosses having the biggest breast, that just makes the most sense for our family. Absolutely. And so you mentioned raising turkeys for some of your family. Do you also sell, um, your meat chicken, your processed meat birds off the farm as well? I do a few off sale farm, off farm sales to friends and family, um, but I don't sell publicly and I don't deliver um, because that whole tier of, um, of processing and certifications and all the requirements for USDA federal inspection versus state versus all of that. Um, I just don't have the facilities or uh, certification to be able to like deliver meat, but I produce less than a thousand chickens per year. It's a thousand chickens or 250 turkeys or some kind of combination of the two in Oklahoma. And so, I mean, there's a whole laundry list of what your processing facility needs to look like and cleanliness and all of that. Um, but we do less than a thousand birds a year. And when we sell them, the uh, customers come to the farm to pick them up. And so as long as we meet those two requirements and are, um, and are checking the list for the cleanliness and the processing uh, requirements and everything, then we don't have to be state or federally inspected to be able to sell that meat. Well, that's good to know. And it very like obviously state to state varies. That's just what it is in Oklahoma. But if if anyone who's listening wants needs to find out that information, they can always reach out to their local extension office and they should be able to help them out. Yeah, that Ag Extension Office is a great resource for so many things. They are wonderful and yeah. so underutilized. Yeah, very much so. Much like libraries. I yeah. always feel like we don't <laughs> utilize the libraries enough. Exactly. <laughs> So how do you raise your meat birds? Do you raise them in like, um, like a, a run setting or do you run them on tractors free range? What does that look like on your homestead? We have, um, we actually are setting up a new coop right now at our previous residence. I had a coop for my layers and they free range. And I, then I had a separate coop plus a run for my meat birds. And so they were confined to that run. Um, but in the panhandle, we really don't have grass. <laughs> we really don't have green grass ever. And so a tractor just doesn't make sense for us. As much as I would love to, I love when people get to run them in tractors and they get lush green grass every day. And that's just not a reality for us. <laughs> And you so know, I think that's some, I think that brings perspective though. Like, you know, you imagine like, birds out on pasture and out on grass. And that's not normal for certain places like the panhandle. Like you don't have that option. So I think that's good to take into consideration. Where are you raising your birds? Exactly. Yeah. And so as you know, I would love to be able to free range them or, you know, let them on pasture. Um, and so I just do like a, a, con a commercial bird feed plus wild bird seed. Um, because then that gives them a little variation in their diets and then chicken scraps and stuff like that. But um, in our new setup, I actually have a much bigger coop divided down the middle, half for layers, half for meat birds to keep them separate. And then both have access to the run, but the layers can only get back into the layer side. It's kind of hard to explain, but <laughs> even though they can be together out in the run, the layers will only be able to get back into the layer side and the broilers then can get into the broiler side. Well, and after about two or three weeks, those broilers aren't going very far. 
No, they pretty much stay near the feeder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, when you decided to raise meat birds, what did that do to your chore time? Did that increase it dramatically or was it pretty easy to transition from just your layers into meat birds? It was fairly easy, um, easier than I had expected it to be actually. And with the feed and the Cornish crosses, I just do the 12 hours on feed, 12 hours off feed schedule, um, and then kind of adjust depending on how they're growing and how they look and their behavior and stuff like that. Um, and so we were going out and feeding like our horses twice a day anyways. And so, you know, the layers need so much less attention. Like you can just see them like every other day, every three days and they're fine. Um, but the broilers we did have to take care of every morning and every night, but because they're on they they mature in, you know, seven to eight weeks. And so you only have to do that for a couple months, you know, and we only do it twice a year. And so that's only like four months out of the whole year. So it really, it's really not that big of a deal for us. A small time investment for a yeah. big return, right? Yeah. <laughs> So have you found that since people now know that you raise poultry and you process poultry that like we've seen a lot of shortages in recent times in the grocery stores, have you noticed more and more people reaching out to you asking if you sell your chicken or asking if they can purchase your chicken? I have, um, especially people, uh, locally, they have been more interested in it. Um, I think that they, are also seeing not just the shortages, but I think the outbreak of the bird flu has some people concerned. And so the, you know, the grocery store meat is becoming more and more expensive. And I sell my uh, chicken for 450 a pound as whole chickens. And so they're kind of comparing the two and thinking, oh, Megan's is not that much more expensive. So I might as well go with hers. Right, and know where it's coming from and how it's raised and yeah. how it was fed. Yeah. There's something to be said about that homegrown meat. Mm -hmm. Now, what I really want to talk about is something that you offer a really amazing resource. I know we have a lot of people that are just contemplating whether or not they want to dive into raising meat chickens for themselves. Uh, maybe they're unsure of whether or not they can go through with the whole processing scenario because in the, in the end, after they're grown, they're going to need to be processed in order for your family to consume them. And I like to recommend that if somebody's unsure or not really in the know about the whole process to reach out to a local farmer or homesteader, see if you can, you know, join them on the day of processing to view the whole process to see if they can get their hands dirty and, and if that's something they can do for themselves or their family you have launched a virtual broiler school. Tell us all about that. Yeah, so, so I, I do, do think that firsthand it's in getting your hands in there, it, there's nothing that can beat that. That, that you know, face-to-face, -face, this is how you do it, seeing it in action kind of a thing. I think that's definitely the best way to learn. Um, but if there are so many people who don't have access to that because it's a skill that's not really being passed down, you know, generation to generation anymore. Um, so I started this online course called the Broiler School, and it's all about raising and processing meat birds. And that can be, you know, dual purpose, rangers, Cornish crosses, whichever, whichever breed you choose to use as meat. Um, I cover all of those. And there's a lot of video content because it's something that, like I said, is best learned in person. But if you can't learn it in person, you know, watching videos is probably the next best thing. And I found that when I was trying to learn how to raise and process my meat birds the first time around, there was a lot of information out there, but it was so scattered. And so it took me so long to really dig through everything. And, you know, I had my grandma and I had my mom who had done that, you know, dozens and dozens of times, but um, it had been a while since they had since they had done anything like that. So there was stuff they didn't remember. And there was, you know, 
techniques and skills that have kind of changed yeah. and the standards have changed since they did it. And so I, I was finding that more and more people were reaching out to me as a resource for, you know, after a few years of doing this, um, reaching out to me and asking questions, using me as a resource for their own personal flocks. And I was thinking, I might as well just turn this into a course and have one, you know, area where people can go. It'll be comprehensive. It's everything they need to know. You know, it's enough detail to really educate them, but it's, you know, simplistic enough to where anyone can do it really. And so I, you know, that was, that's my big motivation is getting it into the hands of people who have a desire to raise their own meat, but maybe they're not confident about it, or they're unsure if they can make that first step, or they don't even know where to start. If you want to raise meat, I want to give you the power and the confidence to be able to do that for yourself and your family. I think that's incredible. I, and it's very true. It's not a skill that we're seeing passed down as much these days. And it's, it's definitely a necessary skill for most people. Um, you know, those, those meat shelves are, you know, very sparse right now and the cost is only going up. So to be able to obtain that skill to raise your own meat is just priceless. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I have to ask, what was your first processing experience like did it go off without a hitch no issues or was it kind of chaos mine was chaos mine was chaos too <laughs> it was it was i mean we got it done and i was so proud of myself i was so proud of myself for getting it done but my mom and my grandma came they traveled from they live in colorado we live in oklahoma they traveled all the way here so that they could basically instruct me and help me and, but we didn't have any extra equipment. I didn't have a propane burner with a pot for scalding. We, my, my mother-in-law, bless her heart, heated up water on the stove to like 190, 200. So that by the time she carried it outside, it had cooled down enough to scald the birds. She'd pour it into the big pot that we had outside. And we could do maybe like two or three birds with that hot water before it got too cold and we'd have to dump it out and she would go back in the house and heat up more water and she, that was all she did all day long was just run us hot water for scalding and we didn't have a mechanical plucker and so we plucked everything by hand the scalding was the bigger deal so that was the propane burner with big pot was the first investment that I made for the next round and then the next round after that I invested in a mechanical plucker but um I bought like a couple of processing knives and then I just like gathered up all of the cutting boards in my house. And I was, I was, gosh, I think it was like seven or eight months pregnant with my first daughter at the time. And so I was tired and it was, it was hard, but it also showed me that you don't have to have all of this fancy equipment. You know, a mechanical plucker is not cheap. You don't have to have a mechanical plucker. You can put in a little extra elbow grease and do that instead if you want to. And I'm thankful that I've been able to, you know, invest in the operation and get that equipment to make things easier for us and make things go quicker and everything. But, um, you know, we still did it and the birds tasted the same. It was just harder. <laughs> You just, you persevered. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I have a similar story. One of the first times we processed, um, it was broad breasted turkeys. And of course it was our first batch. So we grew them way too long. So they were ginormous and we didn't take into consideration the size pot we would need to scald them. And we ended up getting a metal trash can and fitting it over our fire pit because that was the only thing large enough for us to boil water in. It was, it was chaos. It's hard. That, that first learning curve is you learn a lot fast. Most definitely. And you know, every time I think you tweak it, I don't think it's perfect the second or third or fourth time. I think every time you learn something different and you're just perfecting those skills and it gets better every single time. I completely agree. Yeah. Now, what advice would you give someone who wants to start raising their own poultry for meat? Wow. I would say 
you are more capable than you think you are. I think that, you know, we, I think especially when dealing with animals, raising animals, it's intimidating because you have to keep this thing alive and you're in charge of its life. You're in charge of its quality of life. You're in charge of how it gets slaughtered. You know, you are, you are responsible for all of that. And so there can be that hesitancy because it's like, well, this is like a living thing. Like if my garden dies, my garden just dies. It's not, you know, it's not a big deal, but like, if I'm not properly taking care of my animals and I'm not raising them right, then you know, that, that gets kind of, kind of tricky. And so I think that that holds a lot of people back. They think that, you know, that's, that's way more difficult than just, you know, gardening or, you know, other aspects of homesteading. Um, but I think that if you take the time to educate yourself and take the time to plan, it really will be more straightforward and simple than you think it will. I completely agree. Um, I thank you so much again for joining me today. I'm going to link your broiler, your virtual broiler school in the show notes below, because I think that is an amazing resource for people, not only who are thinking about processing, or maybe they've already tried their hand at it, but want to perfect their skills and maybe learn something new. Um, there's no one size fits all. I think we're, I think the, the only issue we have is, you know, our only downfall is when we stop learning. I think we need to continue learning to become better homesteaders, better poultry keepers, um, because the payoff is going to be big in the end. Definitely. I completely yeah. agree. And with that, we thank you for listening to The Coop. Be sure to subscribe. And if you'd be so kind, drop us a review. Have a poultry related question or topic you'd like us to cover? We want to hear from you send us an email to podcast at meyerhatchery.com.